Hello, Finland. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming to my presentation about me. Uh, I hope it's sort of interesting. My name's Luke. Uh, I make games in the US. Uh, and I guess I'm going to tell you about that. Uh, so yeah, so hello and thank you. And so th this presentation, I actually hate talking about myself. I really hate it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about me, and then I'll tell you a little bit about one of the games I made, and then I'm going to tell you about a game that I played that I liked a lot and is uh, a, I feel is a good example of what I like in games and why I design games. So I hope that's interesting. And then I'll take questions from you all at the end. And um, if you get bored, you can just leave. It's fine. I won't be insulted. I might make fun of you, though, if you leave. Um, <laughs> so all right. Uh, so yeah, my name's Luke Crane. Uh, I, my publishing imprint is called The Burning Wheel. That is me and about 30 of my closest friends. Uh, we, that is a, an event I host in New York City called Burning Con, where people come and play my games and the games of my friends. Um, but yeah, so this is my pedigree, as it were. These, these are all of the, the titles that I've published or designed uh, in the last 14 years. I would really like to know what drugs I was doing in 2008. That's, uh, <laughs> in addition, in 2008, I also had a full-time job at a game design company. So I don't know what was going on there. Uh, is anyone, does anyone know any of these games? Does anyone? Lost Guard. Uh, cool. That's cool. Has any, does anyone know? Oh, I'm going to use the pointer. This is so rad. Oh, does it, anybody know Free Market? Does anyone play? Yes. You guys are the best. Um, so, so yeah, I started making games when I was a kid, but I only started publishing games in 2002 because I thought it would be a good idea. Uh, it's, it was not a good idea, but, um, and uh, so yeah, I made a bunch of games, a bunch of role-playing games. Uh, I love role-playing games so much. All right. <laughs> um, oh yeah, I won some awards and stuff, but that's really boring. Uh, I uh, I love I I actually love speaking at conventions. I love uh, talking to you all, talking at you really. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, Comic Con or PAX or and that's actually from Burning Con, my con, and then Gen Con. Um, I, I travel around. I talk about stuff, games. Uh, I also spend a lot of time on the internet. Have I interacted with any of you on the internet? Have any of you written? I mean, yes, hello, we're friends in, in real life now, right? After you meet somebody, you're friends forever. Um, so yeah, I, I spend way too much time on the internet. This is the, um, does anybody remember uh, the Watchmen, Ozymandias' TVs in the Watchmen? Yeah, that's, this is, that's my version of that. Uh, I learned it from her, I learned it from Meryl. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, so let me, let me tell you a little bit about my first game and kind of the love of my life, sort of game-wise, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's called Burning Wheel. So this was, this was Burning Wheel in maybe 1997. Um, it was a very, very bad game. Um, printed on a photocopier uh, that I would stay late at work and print copies of the game and then take it to a, a print shop to have them bound, paper bound like that, uh, and give them to my friends and force them to play it with me. I was the, the game master in my group, always had to be the game master, so I eventually said, well, fine, if I'm always going to be the game master, then I'm going to make a game and you're going to play it. And they, they were like, grumble, grumble, grumble. And I said, fine, you run a game. And they said, OK, we'll play your game. <laughs> it's true. And then I pretty much chained them to the table for about four years uh, and wouldn't, wouldn't let them, like basically, once I had them, I wouldn't let them play anything else or do anything else. Um, so yeah, so this is, that's how uh, we got started. Whoa, people, cool. They didn't miss anything important. So. But over the years, what we've realized about Burning Wheel, I mean, Burning Wheel has always had this core component of beliefs, and it's so important for you to express what your character believes and what, you, what your character wants. Uh, and finally, we managed to distill our kind of ethos at Burning Wheel headquarters uh, into this statement, into fight for what you believe. 
This is what we wanted at our table from the, the moment we sat down and play any game, is that we wanted to care about stuff in the game, and when you said you cared about something, we really wanted you to be a part of it and really wanted you to, to, to go for it. The worst thing in games for me is a, a player who just talks talk, oh, we should do this, we should do this, we should do this, blah, 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 and then say, okay, what do you do? You're gonna do that? No, 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 I'm gonna go shopping. Uh, so I tried to design a system that rewarded that player for being all mouthy and saying, you know, we should do all these things and, and encourage them kind of breadcrumbs out of their, their turtle shell uh, away from the shopping mall, the medieval shopping mall, uh, down the path of actually heroic adventure. Who, who here likes shopping in your games? Like where you're, you spend a whole session looking at the equipment list buying things? Anyone? You, well, <laughs> all right, thank you for admitting it, but that, you guys are great, that's cool. I, it's a, my least favorite thing. Um, but uh, okay, so, so the, these are some of the things that I really like in games and these terms that I've invented to describe uh, what I do in games. Uh, Character-driven play, like rather than having a meta plot or an adventure or module, I always want the game uh, or you know, these particular games to be focused on the character and, and basically as a, as a vessel for the player, what do you want, what are you interested in, how are you going to accomplish those things uh, and let that drive play, and the GM then tries to create adversity for you, or tries to make that story interesting, uh, rather than you having to move through a pre-planned story or, or, or something along those lines. It's a it's a it's a subtle shift, but it does it inverts the kind of common or you know the, the early uh, role-playing game model of you know moving through a, a pre-planned adventure. It requires a certain agility, both on the part of the game master. Uh, and to the player, you have to be able to think on your feet. Um, you have to be able, the game master has to be able to invent adversity, like a, a, an antagonist, for example, that uh, is prepared to fight against what the characters uh, believe. And that, that requires some intuitiveness and practice. Um, it's, you know, it's something that we've had to learn over time. And I know that when new groups sit down with my games, they struggle with this. Uh, they also struggle with my games because uh, I, I like to, this is the, the euphemism I've developed for, for my really long, really overwritten, really complicated games. Uh, yeah, in-depth and technical mechanics. This is like, so, so some of, most of you have seen my books. They're like, I think the shortest book I've written is 200 pages, right? The Burning Wheel weighs in at 600 pages. Um, and I, I just, I like it. I like to play those games. Uh, I, I, when I sit down to, to learn a game or to invest in a game, I want to be rewarded. I want there to, to not only be just how do you roll the dice, but how do you get better at this game? Like I'm, I'm very much interested in playing a role-playing game uh, to excel at it and um, to, to learn from it. I want the game to teach me something. So games that are uh, very light or very superficial, that's fine. I'll play them once or twice, uh, but it's games like Pendragon, um, or like uh, my own games, uh, like Burning Wheel, uh, that uh, I really enjoy, that I'll keep coming back to, um, or even Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, right, so uh, I, I've talked about this a little bit, but these are the two kind of primary motivators for your character in Burning Wheel. Uh, you write them as a player, you, you, these are your goals, your philosophies, your ethos. I just think that that's so interesting to see uh, that written out as the kind of core engine for your character. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'll show you in a character sheet in a minute. Lots of skills and numbers and stuff like that. But I, the, for me, the beating heart of the character has got to be the, uh, the, these beliefs and instincts. And we'll, we'll talk specifically about what that means in a second. But the beliefs and, the, and instincts plug right into uh, our reward system. So even though there's skill advancement and numbers and you're rolling dice and trying to get bonus dice and all that stuff, uh, when you, the, the, the breadcrumbs down the trail to tease you out of you know, the shopping mall, uh, which none of you visit, which is great, um, just that guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, you know, the reward system it is designed to um, incentivize you to, for playing those beliefs. Um, and you know, so if it's something that you already do, then it's just a very virtuous cycle. And if it's something that you're, like if you're uh, maybe a shy player or a quiet player, it's something that th the system teaches you. Like you can, you know, you can get out there, you can mix it up. Pa like the reward system rewards you pass or fail in Burning Wheel, everything. Uh, failure doesn't matter. You're gonna, like the way the system is weighted, you're going to fail in Burning Wheel more often than not because if you look um, in traditional narratives, like for example, 
uh, a great one is uh, Indiana Jones and the uh, in Indiana Jones, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, rather. Uh, Anybody know this movie? Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark? A few, few of you? Okay, just checking. Uh, anyway, so the, the main character in this movie does nothing but fail. He fails and fails and fails. Even when he succeeds, he fails. The only thing he does right, spoiler, is at the end, he closes his eyes. Uh, but uh, so, the, so the reward system kind of lets you know that failure is okay. You're going to get rewarded, and then you're going to, you're going to cycle those rewards back into these um, attempts uh, at, at heroism. So, and anyway, as I said, I like my stats and my skills. Like, there's numbers and lists and stuff. I'm not afraid of them. I dig them. Uh, uses six-sided dice. I love six-sided dice. But uh, I'm gonna. So I'm gonna give you some examples. It's one thing for me to be like, yeah, my game. It does these things. It's cool. Uh, I am going to tell you Cedric's story. So Cedric is a character uh, who was created very early on in the system by a friend of mine. In fact, he was created by me. Uh, and my friend jumped into the game. He wanted to play in this world where some of my other friends were playing, right? We had our like long old campaign world and he was jealous. He was really, really jealous and really wanted to play with us. So he kind of like wormed his way into a session. And of course, um, I don't know about you, but I punish people for, for this. And I handed him like a really crappy bandit. Uh, I was like, here, you can play that. You know, they, they just recruited these, these, all these bandits. You can play one of the bandits. And he looked at me, glared at me, he got a glint in his eye. And uh, I didn't notice it at the time, but I, he silently vowed to himself that he would make something of this character. Uh, so if, if, and if you're familiar at all with Burning Wheel, the, the character started off as a three life path bandit. So basically he was, he was born a peasant. Uh, is he in here? Yeah, there he is. He was born a peasant, he's a farmer and a bandit. Uh, 19 years old and, uh, or maybe 20. Um, and very, very simple, very direct character. Whereas everybody else had the, you know, the hoary old warrior, you know, half demon in magic swords. And I made him start with this. Uh, so this is, uh, this, yeah, th these are some of his numbers. Um, and his, yeah, his, he was trolling me in the, be in the beginning. His, you can see his very important beliefs uh, that he, this is the, from the very early uh, example of his character that I don't have a copy of apparently, but yeah, not many. But yeah, and, and these, uh, his instincts, they're terrible, except for this one, watch the boss's back. And this is the kind of first like glimmer of character uh, here uh, for, for him as he begins to invest in this character. So, but this, yeah, and this is one of his later incarnations. Uh, and you, I can't read his handwriting either. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, but yeah, just, this is just like to show you that I'm serious talking about a character. Uh, but yeah, if any of you know Burning Wheel, like slang there, he, you, I'll, we'll get to that in a second. He's got a super high sword skill. Uh, all right, so let's talk about it. Game. I'm going to tell you about my character. Um, so <laughs> All right, so this is our campaign world. This is a map I drew in Illustrator from a copy of another map that my friend drew. Um, in fact, the, this campaign world was born on a very like rainy, boring Saturday afternoon in the 90s where we passed around uh, basically a piece of A4 uh, and each drew a corner of a map and, and then another friend linked them all together and, and you know we made this campaign world. Uh, maybe this was my corner? I don't remember. I took the campaign world. I loved that map so much and I was so jealous of it and so inspired by it. Like after like we drew it and my friend went over it and put marker and colored pencils and stuff. And then they just left it there and it sat there for weeks. I had my eye on it, I had my eye on it, watching it, watching it just sit there. We never played it, we never did anything with it. And then one day I was like <laughs> and, uh, and then we played in this world. After that I started running games in this world and we played in it for uh, probably two decades. Um, anybody else super long-term campaigns? Is it? Yeah, my favorite. Um, okay, so yeah, this so this is so there's uh, <laughs> crazy stuff. Um, so this is the capital, and this bruise on the capital is a magical storm apocalypse that the players caused by accident. Uh, <laughs> Failed spellcasting rule. <laughs> Did not expect that. Um, now I didn't expect that. They ruined the whole campaign. Uh, but it was great. They ruined it and then made a whole new campaign because now we had like fantasy apocalypse. Uh, so right. So th yeah, this is our campaign world and there are all our dumb names. 
uh, actually, and this is why when I watch Game of Thrones, I cringe, because I'm like, oh, is that what we sound like when we talk about our dumb campaign world names? Oh, God. <laughs> the hair scared duchies. Um, anyway, uh, the <laughs> so, so yeah, we're going to go, we're going to, CJ's story is going to, he's going to start there, and I think he's going to go there, and there, and maybe around here, maybe here. Anyway, all right. Uh, cool. All right. So he, so he had at this, so later in CJ's life, many adventures, he had uh, started rebellions, and he, that kind of became his thing. Like, this was his, his subtle revenge, um, because, so what we had done was we had kind of divided the campaign in half where we had the kind of master level characters where all the dumb like you know powered by gods and demon stuff was going on and then but we loved our campaign world so much and we were kind of bored with those characters that we started playing like their students and underlings and we started these other sub campaigns within the world to explore it and flesh it out and so he kind of really came to life in this world like it was and I, I realized that as he was playing this, you know, basically a servant to one of the high-level characters that it was kind of crappy. So we invented these other uh, games, these other campaigns uh, to play. Uh, so he had, yeah, he, he, he had, like, that glint in his eye started to really take form. Every time his master would send him on a mission, he would decide that the best way to accomplish this mission was to start a revolt or rebellion in the town or province or wherever he was. Uh, and he, so he was, he, he actually eventually earned a trait of like troublemaker or something. Uh, so, but he, he was, he's also, my friend Rich is very savvy, uh, very clever, and he would always manage to spin his work whenever he, he, he um, came into the halls of power, he would kind of bend knee a little bit and, uh, and, and manage to paint it in the light that he was serving rather than, than undermining. He was really undermining. Um, but so he became friends with uh, the princess regent of the realm. She was uh, ruling in absence of um, a crowned heir. And uh, so, and he became her, uh, the, you can see his amulet there is actually his, a symbol of his office. He became what was called an inspector for her. Basically someone who rode out into the, the provinces and made sure that you know, all the taxes were being collected and everyone was being, obeying the law. Basically a spy or, or a whatnot for her. Uh, the, the princess, and, and um, so he, he was really obsessed with ending all wizards in my world. He, because of the magical storm, uh, he was where his, he's from, his bandit farmer family is from the area that was bestormed. He, so he, his character was completely obsessed with finding this magic sword uh, and just using it to destroy all wizards, and he was gonna start an anti-wizard killing cult, and he had all these crazy plans. Uh, so here we go. Um, I have to challenge that. So, I, you know, he, he was looking for information on this sword and he's looking at the capital and, or wherever. And uh, I, um, so I had the princess step up and, and challenge us. I knew that he cared about this character. I knew he, he was really invested in her. Uh, and she, you know, she wanted to kind of shape his behavior and send him off on a uh, more important mission. Sweeman. Uh, so, so in Burning Wheel, there's a social combat mechanic uh, because I love this nonsense so much. So when we really, really care about something, I mean, sure, we role play, we talk about stuff, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm, I'm using a funny voice. Um, but when we really care about stuff, we, we fight it out uh, using the, the, uh, what's called the duel of wits. So you have your argument versus my argument, and then there are attacks and defenses and, and good stuff like that. So uh, so Rich, he made, so he makes his move. So the princess is like, you know, I want you to, to go and find my brother um, who had been kidnapped by Rich's friends. So her brother would be the, the heir, um, but uh, Seajuk and his friends earlier in the campaign had managed to just slip him away during the storm apocalypse. They were like, oops, lost the heir to the empire because they hated him. Um, very clever. Uh, so anyway, so he uses this, uh, like, so he's, he's disposed of her brother, uh, and now he's using this as his chance to uh, get her to topple the old order and step up uh, instead of uh, just as the regent princess is basically declare herself empress uh, in, in this argument. So really high stakes. I, he surprised me. I was like, whoa, okay, nice one. Uh, and then hers were very simple. I, I, knew, I knew Rich hated her brother so much and because he had disappeared him. 
uh, that I was like, okay, this is a good quest for him, find him. Uh, it's, a, it's just a great way to challenge what he thinks about his character too, uh, to confront him with a deed that he has done in the past and something that he hates uh, and see if he'll go for it. Uh, and so yeah, this is the duel which I was talking about. So you choose your actions, your points and dismisses. You have, you have kind of hit points essentially for your argument. You would write that statement on the previous slides up there. Uh, and then we, we play it out one, two, three. And uh, so, but what this results in, it, it, the way the, the rules work is it results in a compromise. Um, the, uh, the more damage you take, the more you have to give your opponent. Uh, so, uh, so basically, he, she agrees uh, to take the role temporarily uh, until the uh, rightful return of her brother. Um, so a little bit of a compromise there. So, so Rich is going on this mission where he has, he's very loyal now. He, he really loves his character uh, in, in the, the now Empress, but um, he, he has to. He's bound to try to, ref to honorably return her brother, but he really hopes that he fails. <laughs> it's good. Uh, all right, so Mino's the, the, the lost emperor's name. Um, so he, they did such a good job of disappearing him, they sent their most like loyal NPC to take him away, get him out of here. No, none of the players uh, who were part of that small band of adventurers, uh, none of them actually know where he went. So now he has to, uh, right? Now he has to find his spirit blade to uh, kill the, all the wizards, right? Uh, and then he has to find the emperor. So you get three beliefs in Burning Wheel. So those are uh, two of his three beliefs. His other belief is probably about doing what his boss says, his, his master. Um, so, so right, he starts off using a, a mechanic in Burning Wheel that allows you to find NPCs, to find um, player characters. He goes digging around, I think in the old nobility of, a, of the, that old northern town, uh, asking questions. Um, that's his version of circles, is basically getting into fight with, fights with guys that are too big for him. Um, uh, all right, wait, really? Are we skipping all that? Oh yeah, okay. All right, cool. So he, so he's a bandit, and, and the way circles works is that you, you um, you can't just conjure up any old NPC. If you're a peasant bandit, uh, you can't just make a die roll to bring the king or the emperor or empress or whatever into it. They have to be from your character's past, basically your, your character's life paths. So being a former bandit, he would often go back to his past and, and uh, try, to, um, uh, you know, try to get some knowledgeable bandits involved in what he was doing. So at this point, he had uh, gathered an entourage and he, he was deep into his quest to, to uh, you know, he, he was on a lead and he had heard that, um, he kind of had a general area where he, where some, you know, bad shit went down and possibly either the sword or the emperor might be kicking around down there. So he wanted to find some bandits uh, and ask him some questions. And Noya is his, uh, one of his, part of his entourage, uh, a swordsman who's part of his entourage. So that, so he had, um, so this is where we get back to failure. He fails the circles role, a very simple role for him to, to bring in these bandits. He's, it's something, he has a high circles, they're, they're something very easy for him to find, but he blows it. Uh, and so I say, yeah, you're riding down the trail, you and your other horsemen, and there's a woodcutter up ahead, uh, you know, chopping wood. Um, and uh, Rich knows now, he knows, he knows he failed the role, but he's a good sport. He plays into it, he knows it's an ambush. Uh, he heads up to the woodcutter, uh, right, and, the, and then the, the woodcutter warns him, you know, it's an ambush, get out of here. Uh, and, uh, right, and so this leads us to just a fun action sequence. There he is in all of his fucked up, skinny, runty glory. He's like five foot two. I love him so much. Um, he's, yeah, he's ill-fed, didn't grow right when he was a kid. Um, so, right, haha. -ha. So, uh, so we got into a, a fight between him and uh, Cedric and the bandits, and this is the terrifying Burning Wheel fight rules. Uh, in a one-on-one -on -one game, they're the best thing in the world. Uh, but Sue, I really like chaos and fear in my fights. I love terror. I love, and I love it when someone is uh, overconfident and just kind of doing one thing over and over again, just wailing away, swinging or whatever, and then that. Like, I, I basically, I love Kurosawa movies. I love Kira Kurosawa movies. And when the, when the peasants come in and tackle the dude in the armor and start pounding on him or stabbing him in the face, like, 
that's how it really went. Um, uh, I mean, of course, like 100 peasants died, but whatever. Um, so, so yeah, so in, in using the rules, you, you, you plan a little strategy, you, you're picking your actions. You don't have to pick ev from every single one. You're usually picking three to five of these, uh, and usually kind of in the basic attack and defense stuff. Uh, and then uh, we play them off each other one at a time. So in this case, um, Rich just stuns me. Uh, he, he goes charging in no, um, knowing that, you know, a sword stroke, he was unarmored, he, he wasn't prepared for this because it was a failed roll, so all he had was his sword at his side, uh, and he, um, but he, he goes in guns blazing, gets lucky, uh, and he spends his rewards, um, he, uh, he spends his rewards to enhance the roll, and, yeah, chops the dude's leg off. <laughs> uh, because, I, and I, even though I knew he could chop the dude's leg off, it's important, right? It's important to, to get what you deserve. Uh, oh, wait, I'm skipping ahead. Um, chops the dude's leg off, and then that actually, that scene pushed him over the edge. That, for those of you who know Burning Wheel, that scene allows him to uh, gray out his skill or, or basically go from uh, mundane to heroic level um, uh, because he invested in it. Um, he spent it, and not even because he succeeded, he could have failed there. He could have died as a hero, uh, but this, this kind of pushed him to the next level of, uh, uh, of his sword skill. So, that was one episode of his journey, and then, which led him, but he, he then became friends with those bandits, of course, because as you do, after you chop off the leader's leg, and he lies there dying, he's the bandit leader's like, you're an amazing swordsman, you know, please teach my friends. <laughs> 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 totally. Uh, and uh, so th this leads him uh, to a ruin. What was fun about this scene is that this ruin had been explored. This was the third time the ruin had been explored in the course of the game. There was the, the when it was initially discovered by the players, uh, and then they didn't know what it was for, really. And then it, they had to go back at some point. Um, and then now, here again, he, he, he wasn't a part of either of those two, but he had heard about it from the other players, they had told him about it, so he, he kind of like clicked into place, but all of, the, um, all of the traps had been sprung in this ruin where he needed to go and, and or actually, he, he, this was a red herring, he thought he needed to go and find out some information in there. I was like, There's, you know everything that's in there, but okay, come on. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so he goes in, but so as I said, all the traps were sprung, and one of the traps was, this ruin was near a river, and it was a subterranean chamber, so one of the traps, of course, uh, was, uh, you know, a stone block moved and a cistern drained uh, into the main chamber and filled it with water. Uh, but that was all there, he knew that. So he gets down there in the darkness, and he just sees it's a water-filled chamber, and he's like, I really need the information in there. And this is a case of him playing his beliefs. Like, he had a belief about this, even though he was wrong. He's completely wrong. He had a belief about going in there, and finding, uh, you know, uncovering some secret that wasn't in there. Uh, so he's, but he's like, fuck it, I'm gonna go in. Um, and he nearly dies. <laughs> uh, again, as I said, failure, very important. Uh, he, um, uh, he, his tiny little scrawny malnutrition little swordsman can't handle the, the swim under the water. Uh, and so I injure him tell him what had happened that his uh, lung collapsed. But he, you know, so now he's trapped in this water filled chamber. He's on the other side uh, in an air pocket. Um, and uh, he, um, so this is where he spends his rewards. He doubles down, invests uh, in his character, um, re-rolls and um, survives just barely, but only because he had this, this point, this very, very precious, the most precious of all points in Burning Wheel. Uh, you know, secreted away. Uh, but so he, yeah, his character was like spitting up blood in this like little tube. Uh, and he, um, yeah, he manages to heave the kind of ancient stone cap off the end of the tube and, and crawl out like pretty much through the earth um, and survive. And then he had to go and rest up, uh, recover his lung. Um, so, but, but then he returns back to his circles now, but he, th it wasn't a complete failure. He learned a little bit of information. He learned some stuff that, that um, he kind of learned what he didn't know down there. So he is, um, he's far from home, but he is at the site of a rebellion uh, that had succeeded, really, um, sort of. Um, 
a few years ago, and he had heard that the, the, the person who led the rebellion actually possessed the sword that he was looking for. So he, he, now he's like, okay, I just got to find that dude who had the sword. Uh, and of course, the myths about this guy is that he, he, he was assassinated or that he ascended to heaven or, you know, there's all these crazy myths about what happened to this leader of the rebellion. Uh, they called him the Dread Lord or Dread King or something. Um, and this was actually, this was fun too because this was, that was all player character driven stuff. That was all stuff that we had played out years before uh, that he was now uh, revisiting. Um, so yeah. Uh, so this is cool. This was clever of him. Uh, he wanted to, um, right. So he, he knows that he can't hit the difficulty to find the Dreadlord himself by making that roll. So he says, how about somebody who was there that day? Smart. Uh, and this leads him to being arrested <laughs> and imprisoned uh, by these zealots uh, who are like fanatical about the, you know, the Dreadlord. And um, he, so basically the, one of them comes to him in his, his little wooden jail cell and says, you know, what are you doing? Why should I help you? You know, or, you know, are you just another treasure hunter? And so they get into, uh, they get into an argument. Uh, and Rich says, he, Rich doubles down, triples down, quadruples down. He says, fuck it. I'm going to be the new Dread Lord. That's why you should help me. I'm going to rekindle the, your failed rebellion. I'm going to take your hopes to the stars. Uh, and we're going to kill some wizards. Uh, he, so, right, he's still on his, that belief. He's still on target. And he goes for it, totally wins. Um, uh, but yeah, he wins by one point. Uh, so, and, and basically, I have to admit here that, he, that basically everything that he's looking for is nearby, uh, but you can't have any of it. <laughs> Ha ha ha, and so that yeah, that, that's that's a bit of the compromise. So, so he goes. Um, so I. So he, this this zealot Jew takes him to uh, an old military camp along a river, that had been abandoned from a war, fought. Uh, in in the campaign years before, and uh, and. This is where he finds uh, the sword, the Dreadlord, and the king. Basically, all of their the player characters' minions had they they didn't they're not terribly creative. They don't really know what to do, and I'm not certainly not going to invent. Uh, I'm not going to make them the stars of the show. They did the, the best they could, and they basically took all these things that the the player characters wanted hidden, and they hid them in the, their old secret base. And Rich definitely had a like oh oh moment as he realized that. You know, he knew where this was all along. He could have just asked his boss, saying, where's that secret base? And, uh, and come here right away. Yeah, it happens. Uh, I love doing that stuff. If you ever playing a game with me, you'll see, I always will hide the thing right in front of you. Always, always. So, so he finds Mino. Um, Mino has, so this emperor, this, he was a maybe 20 something. And he's been, I think he's been missing for like five years. He's been hiding out here and uh, he is, mad. I mean, not angry. He is angry. Uh, but he, so he's basically been living in a cabin next door to this insane former rebel lord who's got, who's lost his hand and who has these items of, um, these items of leadership. He has this magic sword and he has a crown and this thing that, that were actually recovered from that ruin, uh, by other characters. Um, so as soon as Rich steps into the scene, I just grab him, basically. I have Mino grab him and say, all right, good, you're finally here. Kill that guy, get me that sword, and let's get the fuck out of here. Uh, and, uh, and I say, let's go. And Rich turns to me, look at that, he's so eloquent. Look at that. I will never commit murder for you, you corrupt weakling. I wrote it down, actually. I wrote when he said that. I was like, oh my God. Uh, there was like, he was so, and he, he had that like hard glitter in his eye. He just didn't want any of my shit. It was great. I, like, I totally had him over the table where he just had a hate on for me, um, and which is exactly what I wanted. Like, he just so despises this character, and he was so invested in playing these beliefs now. Uh, so I tried to sweeten the deal. Uh, I mean, <laughs> this was a ter but this is also me trying to role play this emperor that he's completely tone deaf. He's a kid. He was raised in seclusion, you know, in the 
uh, you know, kind of imperial family, never really got to experience the world, so he tries to sweeten the deal saying, come on, I'll make you my personal sword instructor, which is kind of a sinister, like it, it basically saying like, you'll be in this office, you'll be set for life, you'll never want for anything, you can just play swords with me. Um, but it's bullshit, it's total bullshit. Um, so, and I, I'm like bearing down on him, I'm like, are we gonna do this? Are we gonna do this, huh, are we gonna do this? And he's just like, what? <laughs> Um, Rich is, um, Rich actually, in between this statement and me pounding on him, uh, he, he actually just slams his hands on the table and he says, will you give me a fucking chance to fucking role play? Because <laughs> uh, he was just so cranked up and I, I had him in like, you know, we were, this is a one-on-one -on -one game obviously and we had been, this happened over the course of three sessions and this was the last one. Uh, and I, I really had him at, like at, at this like emotional peak, and so I didn't want to lose it. I really wanted him to make a decision uh, under duress. I wanted him to to really feel this. And he's basically he. This is your your uh, right in Burning Wheel. Like the social combat isn't like mind control or anything. If you don't like what the other side is offering, you don't have to get into the argument. So he so he invoked his right to walk away. But that means that he can't. He it kind of. Um, determines what they can talk about in the future. It has, it has a, a mechanical consequence. Uh, oops, there's a typo. Uh, and he, he's, but he screams to me, he screams at me like he's mad at me, and he says, you want me to kill the emperor, don't you? I'm like, I, I'm like, I don't want you to do anything. I just, you tell me what you want to do. <laughs> uh, and this surprised the hell out of me. Like, so he, so I lost the peak, but, but we, like, the, where we fell was not the valley, right? We kind of, we, we came to a new normal here. This is not him, like, Mr. like getting into the fights with bandits on the road just to test out his badass sword skill. This is, uh, this is a different Sejuk, right? No bloodshed. I, I really thought he was just gonna, like, slit my throat, but, which would have had, would have been horrible for him. It would have been terrible, terrible, but I wanted that. <laughs> uh, not, I didn't really want him to kill him, but uh, so without bloodshed. Uh, so this is so he goes back to the emperor, and we try again. We come at it from a different way. Um, uh, so the emperor kind of tries to play into his new idea of like driving out the wizards and all this stuff, uh, or the 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 heir rather. Um, so, so right, we'll restore it and we'll do it together, like, you know, join me and we can rule the galaxy, that kind of stuff. Um, and Rich hits me back, kicks me, he kicks me, because you, you get to invent your own uh, goals for these, these social combats, uh, and he's, he hits back super hard and he says, no, you get nothing, you're going to go with this guy, you're going to go back to your sister, that was the agreement, you don't get any of that stuff, get the fuck out of here. Uh, and... Um, I think I think he won. He won. Yeah, he totally won. So this is my compromise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so of course my compromise is to make him swear to be Mino, <laughs> Mino's sword instructor. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, because I want to just stick it to him. Um, so right, and then the compromise is that they split, right? Rich gets the sword, he's the swordsman, come on. Also, I really want him to have the sword because I want to see what he does with the magic sword. Uh, but Mino keeps the kind of uh, robes of office and whatnot. Uh, but, like, so this was a, like, he won by the narrowest of margins, so he has to give a lot. Uh, so he has to use the, the sword to drive out, um, you know, basically do the emperor's bidding. Uh, right, but, and then once again, he comes back and, and hits on his beliefs. That, uh, you know, he's like, I'll, fine, I'll do these things, I'll lie with you, I'll do all this, but first, wizards, uh, I mean, they did, the, so what, what's great is that, so the, the magic apocalypse that the players caused, Rich, as a player, wasn't there. He doesn't know that the players caused it. He actually is really, truly, wholly invested in killing wizards because he thinks that they destroyed his homeland. He thinks that the evil wizards destroyed his homeland. He doesn't realize that his like best friend, the wizard, destroyed his homeland. This comes up later in another game, and uh, this the sword that he finds in this game gets drawn on that wizard, and uh, when he finds out, like it's a like apocalyptic moment in Rich's head, like his, his head, the top of his skull literally pops off. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh right, but anyway, 
before, so anyway, the emperor, they, they've negotiated the terms here, but the, the adventure's not over. They don't have the sword. There's still a madman in that cabin over there who's got the sword. Uh, so poor, poor Cjack is just getting, this is, this is where the duel of wits really, really uh, comes into force, is where you just, you're getting wrapped up in agreement after agreement after agreement, and it's just affecting your beliefs, and it's, it's really kind of binding your character. It's very powerful. Uh, you know, it, it's, it invests you. So this is, so he goes in here, he goes into this cabin with this like madman who's got a, he's got a, he basically was a slave at one point, he's got a slave mark on his face, he's missing a hand, um, he has all the, the, the ancient artifacts, um, and he's just, he's bonkers, he's bonkers crazy, uh, and uh, Rich just go, meets him crazy for crazy. He just right there invents this whole philosophy. He, like, because he had been learning about this as he went and he learned about it uh, through those circles tests and whatnot. So this, I try to hit him with some like serious, like, uh, you know, zealot gone into like the spirit realm crazy. And then Rich hits me right back saying that basically, oh yeah, I'm going to out crazy you. I'm going to become this like, this spiritual leader. Um, so give me the sword, God damn it. Um, I, he, he surprised me. Um, he wins, and that's my compromise, right? Dreadlord hands over the sword, and he says, like, he basically breaks. He just, he, Rich just manages to shatter his, his entire personality, and he just looks at him uh, as a human being, again, you know, as a, as a man who's just lost everything and just says, please, just end me. Uh, and Rich, uh, yeah, and Rich's compromise is that he has to execute him. Um, and that is how Cedric gained a sword to kill a wizard. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so yeah, so that's that's what I feel is a great example. I mean, it's not often that you get to play a one-on-one -on -one game, but uh, this game was really guided by the rules of the uh, of Burning Wheel, um, the circles tests and the a failed stat test and uh, the the fighting and the dual wits mechanics. Like all of these things weren't secondary to what was happening. They were central to each moment. They, you know, our role playing and our decisions got us there and then these, these, we had these crisis moments where we had, you know, we used the rules to negotiate them uh, and it really enhanced the game. Like all of the compromises that he went through, uh, through the Duel of Wits just, you know, made me fall in love with this story. Um, so yeah, uh, that, is, that is my tale. Uh, if you guys have any questions or would you like to talk uh, like me to talk about anything else, I am at your disposal. Um, uh, yeah, and the art, by the way, it was done by uh, Rebecca Bennington. She's done a ton of other art for our Burning Wheel books and whatnot. She's a, she's a great lady. Um, so yeah, what can I do for you, Ripplecon? Okay, or you could go. It's a nice day out. That's okay, too. And Okay. Oh, question? Yeah. Uh, that's a very Yeah, uh, the um, in uh, the in my games we took the Duel of Wits and we built it into the very core of Mouse Guard and the very core of Torchbearer. Like we actually we we took that mechanic and made um, those two games resolve, you know, centrally around uh, how that works. But in other games, um, in particular, I mean, Vincent was a guest here last year. Vincent Baker. Uh, his game, Dogs in the Vineyard, and then uh, his Apocalypse World games are really, really good at that, at, at um, kind of throwing you curveballs, uh, and so where you're, you, you're never quite getting what you wanted, but you're, you know, kind of almost, almost there. Yeah. I don't at this time. Um, I really like the Burning Wheel Gold book, the one we did in 2011. I feel like. It's a very solid manual, and I feel it's maybe five years of play in that book. Like if you like, just do nothing but play that book. Uh, I feel it's good. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's good for five years. And the um, I just have so many other games I need to design. <laughs> That's really what it is. Is I mean, I love Burning Wheel, and I, it's got to a place where I can. I'm not 
like I was always dissatisfied with classic. I was always dissatisfied with revised. Um, I really am pleased. Like every time I open up the Burning Wheel Goldbook and I look for a rule or a mechanic and I read it, I say, oh, oh, we did that. We fixed that. Oh, that works. Like <laughs> I'm always very surprised or pleasantly so uh, when I play uh, that version of Burning Wheel. So I'm okay with it for right now. I mean, it's my baby. Like I never let anybody touch that game. Like it's all mine. Um, I am very, very protective of it. So I'll come back to it eventually. But, uh, but yeah, right now it's doing fine. Do you play Burning Wheel? Do you play? Yeah, I oh, how long? How? Uh, I haven't played for a half year now. Did uh, one year of it. Did one year of it? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. We'll talk about your campaign later. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, speaking as someone who owns Burning Wheel, uh, I have a gold edition, but has yet to, you know, be able to start it. I mean, it's, it's an amazing book, and it's extremely detailed, but at the same time, it's a bit scary. Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid of it too. For a complete newbie, what would you, just how, how would you get, like, what would be your advice as to how to get started on it? That's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, my, what, where are you coming from as far as games? What, what did you play before Burn? I mean, I've played. Or what are you playing now? Everything, but I mean, mostly Dungeons and Dragons, uh, but recently I've been getting into like Dungeon World and Apocalypse World and stuff like that. Sure. But, uh, I mean, and also, I mean, I, I flirted with a bit of old master back in the day, so. Okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, as a fantasy game, Burning Wheel is very, very different than all of those games. Uh, particularly in D&D, it's just a different paradigm. Uh, but we, you know, I always recommend that people start with the sword and play play that scenario. But there, there's actually a great resource, for me at least, uh, that I can point to now is like, if you want, <laughs> if you want to play Game of Thrones, like, or, you know, just watch a Game of Thrones episode and then you just pluck out the, the characters and choose, like, basically take half of them and make them player characters and half of them make them antagonists. And we even create those characters completely, the antagonists, and uh, write their beliefs about um, the other player characters or how they're going to oppose them or, or whatever. And you have a game right there. And then you can just build out from that world. Uh, it's something that Burning Wheel has, um, has always done very well, that kind of game. Uh, it's also very easy to do. It doesn't take a lot of prep, like because you're inventing most of the stuff. Like you maybe need like a sketch of a of a you know portion of your world, um, but not not a lot of prep. Like you don't have to like not like D and D. Um, but the um, no, don't sleep on me. Oh well. Um, so uh, the um, but yeah, it's just setting up a simple game where you have you know three characters that have these very passionate needs and desires and you know then three antagonists who are seeking to oppose them like it's uh you'd be surprised how quickly that things fall in line there and then just use the first segment of the book like don't don't worry about the uh like the the deeper systems um the the hub i think or the rim rather the rim of the spokes um does that help is that okay we can talk more later yeah yeah so to me the sort of core thing about the thing i like about burning it and uh, I don't know, there might be a lot of people who don't know the system so well, so maybe uh, it'd be interesting to go a little bit more in depth about beliefs that the art of the war system, and maybe also how you came up with it, because for me it's sort of the best thing that I like to bring here. Okay, sure. Um, you know, w we used to play. Uh, we used to play regular games like Shadowrun and Dungeons and Dragons, and I would see as we played these games that there would be these things, like as I mentioned before, these these uh, ideas that players would have or these goals that they would have, and that w where they would either uh, they would back off from them, or that they would like somebody would do something great and they would just drive the whole story with this like very passionate belief about something that had to happen in the game, especially like in our Shadowrun games, it was crazy. Uh, and so I wanted to reward that. I wanted to make a system where that was central, like that, where, there, where it really encouraged you to, uh, to, to drive the game in that way. Uh, and um, so, right, so the, I mean, that's how the belief started. We used to, the original rewards were called brownie points uh, back in the day. Like I didn't know what to call them. And you know, my friends like, what, Rich actually was like, what, what do I write? 
and, and we didn't even have a place for them on the character sheet, in like the early playtest character sheet. And I was like, I don't know, just write brownies on, on the top of the sheet. And, uh, and you know, it was kind of very basic, like every time you play a belief, you get a brownie point. Um, and that is completely broken because it, you know, it leads to basic, it's like the pigeon effect where the pigeon just keeps hitting the receptacle for the pellet because uh, the players are just like, boom, 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 like not, not playing their belief like organically or anything like that. Um, just trying to accrue, make that point number go up. Uh, so one of the, um, one of the beliefs, uh, or one of the, like the quick, like uh, pitches I give people as I say, like if, if we were playing Burning Wheel, we wanted to play a historical, a game set in historical France. Um, and you decide to play um, a young princeling. Um, you decide to play his wife, you know, an up and coming young lady. And, um, and you know, we talk about it and you're, you know, you're going to be uh, related nephew to, the Duke of Anjou or something, because he's a jerk. Uh, and, uh, right, and he's, right, the, so the, the Duke of Anjou is like, is as powerful, or if not more powerful than the king, um, but you're, a, but you decide to be a loyalist to the king, right? So we kind of set up this world, and then um, you, you, you know, you kick it right off with, you know, I'll, I'll stop at nothing to end my uncle, uh, the Duke of Anjou, and, you kick it right off with, uh, you know, I will do whatever it takes to advance my family, um, and you hit back with, um, you know, my my wife is the center of my world and it means everything to me, you know, I'll do anything uh, that sh she requires. Uh, so, so you know, in the game, like maybe there's a a party, a fet, right, and the your you know you see your uncle a little drunk and totter off into the castle, now's your chance. Uh, so, you know, Rondell in hand, after him you go and you, you know, he's standing surveying his lands at a window or something and he sees you as you enter and says, oh, you know, what can I do for, you, do for you, nephew? And you know, he sees the knife and he says, no, no, wait. Wait, 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 you misunderstand me. All of these arms that I've been gathering, all these mercenaries that I've hired, this has all been for you, my sons have died, this, like the gold that I've amassed, like you're my favorite nephew, you're the only one I care about, this is for you. So what do you do? What, do you, my, what was my belief again? I will, do, I will stop at nothing to end my uncle, the Duke of Anjou. <laughs> well, there you go. So your wife walks in. <laughs> As you flush the family fortune down the toilet. <laughs> right, and there you go. Right, just simple, like simple belief, simple action, and we get some drama right there. And then uh, you would be rewarded for that. It didn't matter whatever you did in that situation, whether you ended him or not, uh, you'd be rewarded. Uh, you would, in this case, even the exact same way, you get a, you would get a persona point for accomplishing your belief, or you would have got a persona point for breaking your belief in, in a dramatic fashion for going, oh no, my uncle, what a fool I am. You know, and bending knee to him, you would have been rewarded for that. And th and that, again, like that's what the system really cares about. The ca system cares about you engaging. The system cares about drama. It doesn't care about the content uh, or even really the quality. Um, <laughs> the the quality is up to the group. You know, um, which I think is very important. I think for a system like the system, uh, for especially a system as broad as Burning Wheel, it has to back off in that case and can't pass judgment. Um, it, it's it's got to just say like get in there and play, um, and then, you know, pick up the rewards as you go. Does that answer your question? Yeah. But maybe you might talk about uh, what you do with the brownie <laughs> Well, brownie points you eat. <laughs> sure. Uh, so you, you, if, there, if you were paying attention through the text-heavy slides, Rich spent, uh, oh boy, is it on here in this dismal, dismal character sheet? Um, so there are, no, oh, that's the wrong password. Um, let me see. Yeah, this is definitely got out of here. This is really boring. Um, <laughs> uh, 
I, they're on the back. Of course they're on the back of this sheet, this version. You can kind of see them maybe in there. Anyway, um, all right. So there are th so when we figured out that brownie points were broken and that you could just kind of accrue these piles of points and players would hoard them just because it's fun to have a giant pile of points in your character sheet, uh, we tried to adjust the game. So one, we broke down the behaviors uh, into three sets. There's kind of like the, the basic behavior for the game is just kind of dinging that belief, like just hitting it, playing it, getting it involved in the game in a dramatic fashion, making a role about it, like doing a little bit more than just talking about it, right? That's, that would be one type of reward. Uh, and then another type of reward is uh, accomplishing a, a goal related to that belief or breaking that belief, right? That's the persona point. Um, or even, um, there, there's other ways to get that, but so that's, um, so that's the kind of mid tier. And then the big one actually has nothing to do with your immediate beliefs. The big one is something that the GM hand, hands out. Uh, it's called the deeds point. And uh, this is a way to keep players honest and to let them know that there's another player at the table who's, you know, the world, and so this is, you get this for interacting interacting with the world in a major way. Uh, they got a, I think I gave them a deeds point for destroying the world with their, their apocalyptic spell. Um, oops, but uh, again, right, we're not judging content, we're, uh, we're judging action. Uh, and so, you, right, you spend them to explode your dice, uh, the first one to, to explode sixes, the second one, you add dice to a roll, and then the third one is the, the most coveted because it allows you to either double your dice uh, or reroll all your failures. So players are always after that one. So there's such a huge incentive because that will save your ass. Like when you're drowning in a cistern in an ancient ruin and you have one of these points and you fail your terrible stat test roll, um, you're, uh, you know, it's a, it's a get out of jail free card, uh, those points. So it's amazing how interested the players become in the world and in changing it uh, when that point is on the table. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it works very well as a reward. Yes. Uh, so you have Burning Whale, uh, uh, then you have these other games, uh, basically variations of, of, of the basic system, but set in really different worlds or, or settings or anything. Yep. Could you tell, you, uh, tell us something about why you decided to use Burning Whale instead of designing something else for this Uh, I, I'm just not that good of a designer. Um, I, there's, uh, well, I realized, you know, somewhere in there that Burning Wheel wasn't done and I still needed to iterate on it. Uh, I still wanted to explore it. Uh, and Burning Empires was a bit of arrogance in a way. Like, uh, I thought that I could do it. I saw some, like, echoes of Burning Wheel in Chris's comics, and so I thought I could do it. Um, and I thought I could map Burning Empires into uh, Burning Wheel. And I realized I didn't quite work. Like, it, looking back on it now, I, don't, I think that's, that's all, not my most successful design, just because I, I, didn't, I don't feel like it speaks enough to Chris's world. Um, Mouse Guard, though, was our attempt to rectify that, was our attempt to fix that, and to go to, to subordinate um, our rules to David's world and to really um, to, to make sure that David's world was the most important thing uh, in that game and then that our rules supported that and I felt like they do a really good job. I feel like with the belief system and, and that we add some, you know, we add some game to his world with the, the way we did the conflict mechanics and the turns and whatnot. Like we, you have to add some structure to it. Otherwise, I mean, you don't need to buy my game. You can just go run around the woods with mouse ears and you know, <laughs> pretend to be mice. Uh, but I honestly, like, I mean, w I mean, I really, I'm just, I'm not that good of a designer, I'm no Vincent Baker, but uh, I just, I do, I love iterative design. I love being able to, to take something and refine it and, and keep going. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I've done four of those, but anyway. Um. Uh, uh, yesterday I sent a uh, So, so we are doing a uh, second edition of Mouse Guard. Uh, David announced it, I announced it. 
it's coming. Uh, it's done, for, uh, aside from some edits to uh, what one last piece of the, the booklet. Um, so we, uh, I, I tried to make the changes very light. I tried, to, I, I tried not to rewrite MouseGuard from the ground up. I'm very happy with MouseGuard. I think it's a very successful design. Uh, but there are a few sticky points in the rules that I tried to uh, revise and smooth over. Uh, the multi-teams combat thing has been completely revised. Uh, the wises, which are broken, they, they're gone. We use torchbearer wises now, which are much better. Uh, which means the traits got changed slightly. Uh, the traits, traits got modified, so now they, they escalate very nicely from level one to level two to level three. Um, uh, and I fixed recruitment to make it a lot faster. Uh, so, uh, and you, you get, it's faster and you get a better base of guard, mouse guard oriented skills. So there you go. Yeah. Well, Oh, hell yes. Oh my God. Um, well, one of, my, one of my examples, when I first kind of got into the indie scene, um, I mean, I, wasn't, I was a total outsider, so I was coming in I, just like you guys and finding all these amazing games, being you know, really impressed and a little intimidated, but the game that made me cry was uh, Jared Sorensen's Inspectors. If you don't know this game, I recommend you get it, because it's, it's a tiny little game. It's a 64-page booklet. Um, and it does exactly what it says on the tin. And it does the hardest thing. It's a comedy game. You know, it's funny. It's like when you play Inspectors, it's always funny. Uh, it, which is, it's so hard to write comedy in, into games because we're not funny. Like, <laughs> so, uh, you know, Jared just manages to just, it's so light and simple, and, but he manages to turn us into, you know, uh, comedians, um, and he's just very good at that. That's just something I realize he's very gifted at. Um, the other one, though, that really just humbled me uh, was coming to uh, Greg Stafford's Pendragon after I had written Mouse Guard and realizing that so much of what I had done had already been done before. Um, I had only heard of Pendragon uh, up to that point, and again, if you, if, uh, has anybody here played Pendragon? Has anyone played King Arthur Pendragon? It's fucking amazing, right? <laughs> like, the, so you, it's, um, you play knights in King Arthur's court and you're kind of secondary to all the really important stuff to Excalibur and Lady of the Lake and Guinevere. Like, that's kind of like a show that's going on in the background of this campaign and, and it's just one of these games is incomprehensible. How does that work? You know, why would we all just play knights? But it's so beautiful. The game, it's so well researched and the, the, um, the way he does the passions and virtues, uh, it's just so elegant. And like you, in this game, you lose control of your character. You're, you know, your character can run away from you. And it's just, I just think that's amazing to, to, to give the character such life that he's flipping you off, being like, fuck you, I'm gonna kill this guy. And you're like, no, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we got so wrapped up in that game uh, in our hatred for Saxons that when we, the, the like, to, in order to survive, like, so in the, if you play it, if you play Pendragon to the core, you play what's called the Great Pendragon Campaign, which is the entire Arthurian cycle, like, basically the entire history of, like, um, you know, uh, post-Roman Britain, like up to like medieval or even Renaissance Britain, in this like weird kind of mytho-historical setting, and it's this huge campaign. It's like this big as a phone book. We made it like 15 years before we were stabbing each other in the face. Um, but you, in the beginning, it's just you're, you know, the Romans have left, and you're like, fuck you, yeah. And then, oh, what's that? Saxons? What are those? Oh my God! And you're, and the Saxons come and just kick you all up and down Britain. They just kick the crap out of you, so you hate them. There's a, there's a system in the game for hating. It's great, and because you're in battle with them, and you're just like, ha, ha, I hate you, and I'm gonna chop your head off. Uh, it's fantastic. It really helps. But then, like when you, like the Saxons begin to settle in like the next era. Um, after Uther's dead, uh, 
you have to make treaties with them because at this point you're the minority power. They're the they have all the military force. But we hated them so much our characters couldn't deal. My <laughs> at one point, Rich, this guy, like the Saxons send an envoy, <laughs> and the GM is just like, don't, no, what, no, don't. Rich just opens the gate to the castle, punches. <laughs> The dude, I think, to death, uh, like just punches him through the face, the the like probably a Saxon prince or something, and just slams the gate closed. <laughs> it was one of the greatest things I've ever seen. But but it like but he literally he had to like the game dictates it. Like if your rank is is this much, like you can't just talk to these people. You have to go aggro, um, and. It was very taxing. It was very stressful for us. But as a, but as a, uh, as a game designer, I just thought that was so amazing that the game just takes over and just says, "I don't care what you want, player. Like, you better figure something out fast because shit's going down." <laughs> anyway, uh, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, your games have uh, you invent new terminology. You all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you uh, explain uh, why you love that sort? Uh, you have different tones. You Yeah. So how, how uh, important is language and terminology to you and uh, the games? Well, uh, for example, uh, we don't create characters in very good, we burn characters in very good. Uh, that's a great question. So I'm infamous for inventing all my own terms, uh, and people who just like their regular old role-playing games drives them crazy. But role-playing games are games of language. That's it. There's nothing else to a role-playing game but language. It's fascinating to me, and I realized this from the moment one as I started designing that I had to design for people who were talking to one another, right? And and maybe I took some liberties with this, but I realized that I could make you say whatever I wanted. <laughs> and you know, there's a limit to how much nonsense I can make you say. But coming from having played Shadowrun, I realized that I can make you say a lot of ridiculous things. Like, the, the, I mean, Shadowrun gets you to talk like an asshole. So, um, so I, uh, I have no, no problems with Shadowrun, though. Um, so I realized early on that, that uh, not only could I be a troll and make you say whatever I wanted to say, but it was also very important to the game to, to um, to take you out of what you think is gonna happen. You think this is gonna be like another game, it's not. You think you're playing in this world, you're not, right? I needed to develop these terms on purpose to jar you out of your, uh, your experience. Uh, my games don't play like other games that they look like, or they don't look like other games at all. Uh, so, I mean, I took a whack at it with language, and I backed off in Mouse Guard, but I, um, you know, and I, I, I yeah, I eased off a little bit, but it, it, but only kind of in one direction. I actually accelerate in the other direction. And Mouse Guard is very, very rich in setting terms. And you know, Mouse Guard gets you to talk like you're talking about David Peterson's uh, comics. Um, but in Free Market, for example, there's n if you're playing the game, there's nothing that you can say like w about the game, um, like mechanics or anything like that. You know, not nothing, but very, very little, very, very, very little that is not an acceptable thing to say in the world. And that was a design conceit for us. Like, how do we design a game that sounds like you're talking in the world? Uh, and so that's why, I, like, yeah, that's why free market is exactly what it is, is because it's meant to be an, uh, you know, uh, a window into this world. Uh, but but again, just comes back to the fact that in order to play role playing games, we have to have a common language. But that but that language also needs to take us out of our experience and um, let us know that we're somewhere else right now. It seems like it should be played in English. It seems like it don't seem to play in English because there's so much terminology that should be sort of in world. That's very fair. Yeah, I, I can ask my friend to translate it. I guess <laughs> post a, a Finnish one sheet. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you mentioned Mouse Guard, and I mean, having read a bit of Mouse Guard and also recently acquired Torchbearer, um, speaking of that difference in tone. I just love the fact that in Mouse Guard, you know, uh, guys that fail are called traitors, whereas in uh, Torchbearer, they're scoundrels. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, I can just imagine, like, a player rolling their entire hand of dice and then uh, seeing nothing but ones, ones and twos and threes and going, SCOUNDRELS! Yeah, yeah, you scoundrels, yeah. I mean, basically, like, uh, this 
this relates to what you just said. I think it establishes a certain tone and language for the game. And I, as I said, I haven't I yet to try any of your games, so I don't know how work, well it works in practice, but on paper it looks like, it looks nice. Thanks. Does anyone, uh, has anyone played Mouse Guard here? Does anyone know why the dice are called traitors in, in the first edition? Traitors are called. Yes, but there's a there's a real reason. There's a because that's what Saxon says. Saxon, when he's talking about Barkstone and what Kenzie tells him about what's going on in the comic, Saxon yells traitors. Uh, so I, that's I mean it's right from David's world. Um, though interestingly enough, we changed the term um, in uh, the second edition for the failures. So you shall see. I'll leave it. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it as a surprise. Um, am I okay on time? Or is like this? Yeah, okay. I'll stay here all night. <laughs> all right, you, you've already asked a question. I'm going to go up here, uh, but I'll come back. Yep. Yeah. Uh, failure is a part of drama, and you said failure is also an, an integral part of Burning Wheel. Yes. Uh, the question is how to make uh, failure interesting, since if it's kind of a casual role in the game kind of like orienteering or something. If the party gets lost in the woods and everybody dies, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense in the uh, drama. drama, but you wanted to do something because the uh, role failed. So is there some kind of rule of thumb for how to uh, fail and make it interesting? That's a huge question. Uh, that's an enormous question. So the, let me see if I can draw a box around it. Your failure, um, your your failure has to be in, in perspective to the big picture, right? Your failure always in any game ever, but particularly in Burning Wheel, it has to be in, at the right scale and scope and time. You the failure mechanics in Burning Wheel are very open ended uh, on purpose, so so <clears throat> there's that. It needs to be in scope of the big picture. Also, your your you're hinting at already at a prescriptive style of play, uh, which Burning Wheel does not do very well in that like, we're going through the forest and if you expect to get to the other side, because we need to get to the other side to, you know, for the, the plot to continue, don't make that roll. Don't ever make that roll <laughs> in Burning Wheel because you're gonna fail and then you, whatever needed to be done is not gonna be done. So if they just need to get to the other side and it's not a conflict, then don't fucking roll. Uh, because, because every moment of testing the dice and burning wheel is going to turn the story in one way or another. Uh, so don't fuck with the dice. Uh, it's very powerful when you roll. But in that case, I've been there. I've called for that roll. Roll, we'll just get through the wood. Let's see how long it takes you, blah, blah, blah. Oh, fuck. How could you, you have a great skill. How could you do that? Um, they drop a pack. They lose something. They're delayed a few days. Uh, you know, the, uh, their foot sore, right? They have to all have to make fort tests now to see if they get an obstacle penalty uh, to continue on. Like, just, you just wanna, like, those are small additional obstacles in the path that don't divert them, right? So if you're making this test that's kind of almost like a measurement of, of your progress or something that you feel like, you know what, I don't wanna deflect them from their ultimate goal, which is a good, honestly, you know, it's something, good to keep in mind, we often realize it too late, but it's definitely good to keep in mind. You just make sure that the failure consequences are not apocalyptic. Like, that's why the failure is open-ended in Burning Wheel, so you can dial it back uh, and not have it be, um, you know, like, oh, you're lost in the woods, you're, you know, there's a dragon, you're all gonna die. Like, it doesn't have to be like that every time. Um, Torchbearer is our way of trying to teach how to use failure in Burning Wheel. Right, the torchbearer twists. Like we, we have a whole chapter that just lists possible twists, and they're, they're It's us brainstorming and saying, like, this is how our games work. Uh, anything else? Oh, we. Oh, wait, yeah, you had your hand up in the back. Sorry. Uh, oh, sure. Uh, so I'm the. I'm also the community manager for games at Kickstarter. My job is great. Um, I, you guys submit games, uh, and I look at them and say, that's great. <laughs> uh, but I also help creators build projects and talk to people and pat them on the head when they're really worried. Has, it, has anybody in here uh, back to Kickstarter project? Sweet, that's awesome. Uh, so yeah, I mean, 
I am also the voice for games inside of Kickstarter. I'm the translator since they don't know what the fuck half that stuff means. They're, so literally one of the press guys came to me a month or two ago and said, what are miniatures games? <laughs> And I had to explain to him, because they're a huge part of Kickstarter. The miniatures games funded an enormous level on Kickstarter. And like, right inside the company, they're like, what do people do? They paint these? They do what? And th so anyway, uh, so yeah, I do, I do that stuff and then and, and go to meetings. I go to lots and lots of meetings. Yeah. Oh, I'm the worst at this. Have you read The Adventure Burner? Have you read? The, yeah, I, I admit it. So one of the rules in my games is, in Burning Wheel in particular, uh, <laughs> is that you're supposed to tell the players, like, okay, you're going to make this orienteering test. If you fail, you're all going to be foot sore and tired on the way out or something like that. Uh, you're supposed to put the stakes of failure up front, and players are actually welcome to renegotiate and try to find another way or get helping dice or do these things. Um, I get so into it, I totally forget. You know, I'm just like, go roll, go do, yeah. I totally forget. Uh, and it doesn't break the game, but I do think it diminishes the game. Like, this is definitely one of the places where, like, Burning Wheel was written to correct my bad habits. And, like, so it's kind of a do as I say, not as I do moment, which is terrible, I know. Um, it's, I'm sad to admit it, but it's true. Uh, so it really does, it, like, the rule is good intentioned and totally works. Uh, where it, you know it keeps a dialogue going between you and the players, uh, keeps us both honest uh, about the players, get, you know, having a good chance of success, and and the game master, um, you know, uh, ha making sure the role is legitimate. Like, because what Burning Wheel doesn't instruct you to do is that if you're hesitating as a game master and you're like, oh, I don't know, what happens if you fail? Just move on. Just say, okay, yeah, okay, you, you march through the forest. Uh, like that's. That's one of those things where the game is kind of blind to itself, uh, where you know we didn't realize that that would be trouble. We didn't realize that would be a, a stumbling point for for uh, players who were running the game. But um, you know that. But we tell people on the forums over and over and over again. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. Sure. is not stake setting. Fuck no. God, I don't know. No, it's not stake setting. Uh, it, there, there's no, like when you say if you fail, you'll be tired and foot sore on the way out. That's it. That's what happens if they go that route. And they say, well, can we just take the long way around the forest or take the river or something like that? That's them saying we're not going to walk through the forest, right? That's like, that's them looking down the road being like, mm, nah. It's not like, well, can we walk down the road on one foot and save our other foot? You know, or like, like that, like that's, once you lay that out, that's non-negotiable. Uh, like, the, it, that's the intent. I know some groups devolve into stake setting, and I will come to your house um, if I find out that you're stake setting. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's a dirty word where I'm from. Uh, I, and it seems like it's a, like a, where maybe splitting hairs, but uh, it's, like it's important there because the relationship is that the when you say okay this is what's going to happen when you walk down this road then the players say okay well we'll all get walking sticks and uh, we'll repair our shoes before we go down the road and you know like it, it it's there to give them information and let them kind of flesh out the world it's not there for them to yell at you and be like that's bullshit what what if uh, what about if uh... It's, it, so it usually works uh, and and honestly if if the, the relationship is quick, like once you get used to it, like, okay, yeah, if you fail this, um, you know, your boat's gonna capsize or something like that. Like, it should be like simple, quick things like that, uh, that, um, you know, that are kind of a back and forth, a conversation with the players. Uh, it can sometimes devolve into like negotiations, which is horrible, I know. Uh, it's, a, it's definitely a weak spot in the game. Uh, but yeah, just make your players roll. Just be like, D -d 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 -d, just roll the dice. <laughs> Are you helping? Are you helping? Are you helping? Roll the dice. <laughs> uh, anything else? No? Uh, yeah, you haven't asked a question yet, right? Yeah. Uh, what's the hardest thing in game mastering, in your opinion? Hardest thing in game mastering, in my opinion? Uh, the fact that the game master is always saddled with organizing. I have enough shit to do with running the game. Why do I have to organize the games too? 
uh, that's th maybe that's not the convention here, but in the in the states, it's the worst thing. Where the, the game master is like the host and the organizer and scheduling, and I hate that. But anyway, but you meant in the game. Um, worst thing, game master. When the players get mad at me, <laughs> it's hard. Uh, what I you know. Sometimes we like we play very intensely at home. We play really hard, and sometimes there are uh, feelings involved. So when yeah, or when uh, like you know, I love game mastering. It's something I've done my whole life, and I, I hope to keep doing it. And I love coming up with adventures and um, scenario ideas and things like that. Uh, I hate making NPCs. I hate statting them out. That's the worst thing in the world. Um, but honestly, when I feel like my players, like when I, <laughs> the hardest thing is when I feel like I have this like beautiful climax and I bring all of the elements together and your enemy is there and your enemy is there and your ally is there and this new thing is there and all this crazy shit's going on and the players are like, I just stab it. Uh, <laughs> or, or, they, or they get mad at me. You're like, what do you mean my enemy's there? How did she get there? Ugh, and I'm like, we playing a game or what the fuck? What is that written on your sheet for? And so when the, uh, that's the hardest thing. When I feel like the players don't appreciate the beauty of what I've created. <laughs> <laughs> Anything? Wait, uh, did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you had this up. Uh, what do you mean? These projects? Which oh yeah, we D and D. Yeah. Oh my God, dude. Um, so uh, two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, I ran a D&D campaign uh, using the Red Book Moldvay rules from 1981 and uh, some of the original adventures, B1, B2, B3, and B10. Um, uh, and we did it for a year in my home group. And uh, it, came, it sprung from an argument. My co-author and Torchbearer, Tor and I, uh, we were working on Torchbearer at the time, and we were having an argument about how something worked in D and D. And I grabbed my book and I looked it up, and and, and, and you know, and I we were just arguing. And, and I realized I had a flash. I kind of saw us standing there, and I realized we did not know what the fuck we were talking about. And this, and you see this on the internet all the time, people arguing, this is D&D, &D, this is D&D, &D, this is D&D. &D. And I was like, oh my God, I'm an asshole. Oh my God, I'm one of those people right now. So I said, you know what, fuck it, let's play. Whatever, next Wednesday, be here, let's play, let's do it. Let's, let's play B1, um, In Search of the Unknown, which is terrible. <laughs> it's one of the worst things ever committed to paper. Oh, oh my God, though the, the not, the, the weird homoeroticism in B1 is really aces. It's awesome. Um, anyway, but so, so this game, like this was a fucking profound moment for me. So I started playing D&D &D probably right after this, 82, 83, using the blue book, the Zeb Cook expert set book, which is the book after this red book. Because... Um, Basic. I didn't need any basic. I was like, I was 10 years old or something. Like, <laughs> uh, so coming, uh, so you know, divesting myself of all of my preconceptions of what D and D was, because you know, we, because of course we went from expert to advanced, and you know, and then advanced just ruins your brain. It's like bad drugs. Uh, so I'm sorry if you love advanced Dungeons and Dragons. I have all of the books. Um, so, but this, so coming to Moldvay just without preconception and starting and playing and reading the rules and trying to play by the rules and realizing that um, Jesus, H. Christ, this is a great game. There's this booklet is an amazing like edifice of game design. This is, so for those of you who don't know, this, this is right eight years, seven, eight years later into the life of Dungeons and Dragons. So basically after the hobby has gone bonkers, you know, the world is changed at the feet of Dungeons and Dragons. And this guy, Tom Moldvay, gets hired by TSR uh, and can, to write adventures or edit or whatever. And he convinces Gary to let him do the hobby edition, like for, you know, people who aren't like going to war game conventions and playing with, with Gary and company. 
And so this, the text, the tone of this text is really avuncular. He's, he's like, He's like, hey, yeah, the Dungeons and Dragons, and you're going to play a dwarf or an elf or a halfling or whatever, and you know, uh, you're going to die, but it's okay. You're gonna, it's cool. You're going to die. You're making another character. He's like really chill like that. It's awesome. Um, and he's like, yeah, your characters jump off a cliff. Just, uh, just roll a die, and maybe on a one they survive. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's. Uh, it, he has this amazing section of dungeon master's advice in the back. But the game is excellent uh, for its clear procedures. It's fucking mind-blowing. Dungeons and Dragons with clear procedures. Holy shit. Because the first edition of Dungeons and Dragons does not have clear procedures. Second edition of Dungeons and Dragons, nope. This is like, Moldvay turns out to be like the fourth or fifth actual edition of Dungeons and Dragons. But anyway, this edition, very clear procedures. The encounter, combat, magic, like all the like all the stuff that we take for granted in a role-playing game right now. This is almost this has got to be one of the first evocations of that in play. And so what I was I was able to do in play was just kind of give myself over to this game and try very hard not to hack it, not to house rule it, but just play it as written and just be like, oh wow, yeah, you're fucked, you're dead. Um, and just and and also not like we didn't play it like we heard how it was played or even how Gary like said it was played or anything like that. We just played it as it was written. And this is not a game of heroes. This is a game of desperate dumbasses just like hurling themselves into the pit. Um, the, like the the somewhere in there in the BC EMI whatever um, or BE CMI paradigm, they talk about adventure design, and they talk about how you should be leveling up every uh, like two or three sessions or something. So I, I've since played this, so we played B2, Keep on the Borderlands. I have now played Keep on the Borderlands five times since this. Uh, I have three gr work groups that I'm running. I've run them all through this. And it takes you, like, to get past first level and like using the rules as written and the treasure as written by Gary fucking Gygax, it takes um, like for three or four hour sessions, it, uh, playing once every two weeks, it took them like maybe six months to to get a level. And then the elf, the one, the uh, my coworker Nicole was playing an elf. It took her a year to level that elf. It was she said it was the best moment of her life. She'd never played Dungeons and Dragons before. She sat down and she's like, I can't tell you how much this means to me now to have a second level elf. <laughs> and I mean, and I do not pull punches. Like the, so, my initial group lost. 13 characters before things stabilized. <laughs> I'm not joking. And those are characters like, those are even like death upon death characters where it's like, okay, well, your character's died. You can play the, you know, NPC hireling now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um, but just being able to look back into the hobby and find an example of great design and that, and to just be able to better understand that people who talk about Dungeons and Dragons on the internet are full of shit uh, has really helped. Um, uh, also, like d another discovery that we made before it was cool uh, was that is that there's a, this module called Night's Dark Terror, which is the B10 nomenclature. If any of you are into D&D and you don't know about this module, it is one of the best adventure modules I have ever seen for any kit, like uh, including Iron Crown, including any of the other madness. It is so good. The maps in it are incredible. The plot is great. It's goofy D&D stuff. It's Mistara. But uh, it's, it's this, it was done by um, the UK TSR, so uh, basically by the guys who were also doing Warhammer. So of course, like all the art is fantastic. You know, all the cartography is uh, perfect. Um, and uh, I ran them through that, like, I just, I, it was like this magical thing where I was digging through all my old stuff, like, what can I run them for? You know, I, they were third level, and I was like, I need a module for three to five or something? And I pull this thing out. I read about it on the internet. I was like, where did I get this? Uh, it's this huge booklet, and it's for levels two to four, which is a weird spot. There aren't very many adventures for that uh, level tier. That thing is so good. That was another moment of like using those rules in that adventure and just seeing these like two beautiful designs. Like, because B10 is also like the pinnacle. It's like one of the last modules they released in the basic series, so it was very refined. Um, and so to see these two things come together was just uh, was great. And I just feel like I've kind of touched uh, like a really uh, positive, virtuous part of the hobby where, you know, I don't have to pretend I like D&D &D anymore. I can <laughs> uh, that, was in, that was a really long answer, I'm sorry.
I really, um, I'll talk about D&D all weekend. I'll skip all my events. We can talk about it. Um, any other questions? Okay, go home. Ropacon's over. Oh, damn it. Uh, <laughs> why? I did? Did I make that? Pro I, oh, God. I, I, I design games because I have voices in my head. And if I don't do what the voices say, uh, the things get bad. So I, I do what they say, and they tell me to design games, fortunately, and not to do other horrible things. Um, game design helps me make sense of the world. I'm sure that we all do things that help us make sense of the world, and just game design really helps me understand uh, myself and my place in the world. Like, it's a, it's really fabulous. Um, it's a cool hobby. It's a great profession if you can get it. I guess, sort of. Uh, designing games for other people sucks, because um, having them tell you how, how to ruin your beautiful game design is just the worst thing in the world. Game design. Um, anybody here a game designer by trade? Anyone game designers by trade? So don't do it. Uh, it's um, it's also super hard. Uh, it's one of those things where you're like, games, games are fun. Making games must be fun. No, 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 no. What you don't know until you start doing it and you're like already like your arm's already caught in the machine is that making games is getting out all the unfun parts first so that everybody else can have fun later. So basically, I just get all the, t the crying and the pain uh, and, and the misery. Uh, that's, that's what making games is. So yeah, if you're thinking about making games, you should do it. <laughs> okay, go home. <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'm, I'm running, I don't know if it's full or whatever, I'm gonna run a session of Torchbearer. Uh, I'm gonna run a session of my LARP Inheritance, which is uh, my first LARP design, so you guys can come and tear me apart. Um, but I promise we'll have fun, it's a really fun game. And I'm doing uh, two more presentations. I'm doing one tomorrow morning about my, my writing process, uh, and I'm doing one on Sunday about why I think RPGs are awesome. So. Uh, remember Uh, no, no trust it. <laughs> yeah, program's wrong, the, the sign-ups are correct. The updates. So uh, tomorrow we'll be approaching her. Torchbearer at 1330 tomorrow, and then Inheritance uh, at 6, or at 18. We need opportunities here to, to be. Yeah, yeah. All right, anyway, thank you all. You're a very generous audience. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Con.